So we ended yesterday by concluding that it would be perhaps worthwhile studying animals other than the classical models of immunology. And I was trying to point out to you that there is an enormous species diversity in vertebrates and that it would, it, it would perhaps be a good idea to look at more than this handful of species that we commonly consider to be interesting in order to find out what kind of variability there might be not only in the type of molecules that are used for certain uh, functions but also in the general principles by which immune reactions um, are carried out. So this is our summary slide and I already alluded to this slide just to whet your appetite for today so that a, a number of genes that were identified in humans to be the cause of immune deficiencies or malfunction were also identified as a gene in lower vertebrates and in certain instances that are listed here which you don't have to read but you might want to study from the review papers that I um, gave from the outset of the, of the lecture. Read the details how the phenotypes in lower vertebrates match, match up with those in, in humans for example. So there is a lot of correspondence but we also pointed out that the, the, the occasions where there is not direct correspondence and those are normally the interesting ones. Now today I will be discussing the use of small fish models that have uh, gained prominence because they are genetically tractable. That means we can genetically manipulate them and at the same time we can observe them both in their development and in their immunological functions and of course also for other uh, organ functions as well. So I'm outlining this here by way of example for zebrafish. Zebrafish is a very small tropical fish. You might have seen it. You can buy them from the pet shop. They are quite sturdy creatures. Normally they need 28 degrees uh, in water but you can keep them at room temperature though they don't really mind. Um, so they are quite um, happy fellows and what we can do with them, we can make them transgenic. That is, we can take a fertilized egg, so we put male and female together, we have fertilized eggs, we can inject with a fine needle DNA into them. The DNA integrates into the nucleus, not all the time of course, but with a certain frequency, and then is incorporated into the genome, genome that is a heritable genetic change that we can then follow through the generations. That is what we call transgenesis. We can carry out transient and permanent genetic interference, transient by injecting into these fertilized eggs um, um, antisense oligonucleotides that would pair with certain regions on messenger RNAs and would block the translation of these messenger RNAs because they have to be pushed through the ribosome as you know and if there is a complementary oligonucleotide in that particular a modified DNA molecule, that then it, this blocks translation. So that protein cannot be made and of course that causes a phenotype if the inhibition is strong enough. And we call this knockdown because it's not knockout, because it's knocked down because it's never 100% of course. And we can even distinguish between maternal and zygotic function by using a antisense oligonucleotide that would go across an exon-intron junction. So when you imagine a gene is transcribed from a locus, of course it, the primary transcript incorporates exo exons and intronic sequences. And if you then, and that of course the introns are removed by the splicing machinery, but if you block an, uh, an exon junction, then the splicing cannot work properly. And if you target your oligonucleotide to the right place, then you prevent zygotic production because the zygote of course transcribes RNA, splices RNA, makes protein, so you can block splicing, thereby you can block zygotic protein production. When you, um, and maternal RNAs of course are not affected because maternal RNAs are already properly spliced. Or you can block both of them by using oligonucleotides to target a common region, for example the ATG region where there is this, where the initiation methionine is encoded. And, but that is not a permanent interference. 
because as the embryo grows, you can imagine, the effect of this oligonucleotide becomes diluted because the volume just increases and there is, you can't inject again. So you inject once and then the embryo grows. The effect is diluted out, so this is only a transient effect and you can normally see these effects for the first three, four days after fertilization. But nonetheless, for many instances, because development is very rapid in these fish, as I will show you later, that can be quite useful. We now have ways of making permanent changes, and that is a classical genetic uh, procedure, simply mutating, hopefully to saturation, the genome of these animals, and then carrying out phenotypic screens in subsequent generations and simply observe a particular phenotype that you're interested in. In our case, and I will show you an example, impaired uh, T cell development. So if you then mutate the genome, and if you do it right, and if you do it completely, you can figure out which genes are important for the formation or proper formation and development of a certain cell type, in our case, T-cells. We can now even use a system that I mentioned initially, and I think in the first talk, this CRISPR-Cas system. We can then now target specific genomic regions with these guide RNAs that I mentioned that bacteria are used to for the epimethion defense against subsequent infection by bacteriophages. So we can re-engineer this and we can make precise modifications in the germline of these fish. And that induces, of course, a heritable change and that is carried through the generation. So we can have now many options to make these changes. And above all, and that is the beauty of the system, and I think this will, until now, was the main advantage of the system. We can, because the embryos are transparent, we can watch them develop. And if we engineer genetically that we mark cells with different fluorescent proteins, so a T cell expresses, say, a green fluorescence, uh, a muscle cell, a blue fluorescence, or whatever, then we can look at the microscope and see these different colors that is, different cell types behave in the organism. And I will show you some videos, and I hope the, it's not uh, too light, so you will be able to see it. But that is a fantastic system. And these embryos, believe it or not, you can put them in jelly-like agarose, a bit like gelatin, put them under the microscope and observe them for a couple of days. They don't mind, they develop, and you can track individual cells. So that is an enormous resource that one can tap into, and we've try to make good use of this. So many years ago, when all these systems were not so well developed yet, we decided we wanted to embark on a mission for the future, and that is to generate a series of mutants that would impair a specific developmental pathway that we were interested in at the time and are still interested in, that is T-cell and thymus development. So the argument was we would take male fish mutate their gonads, as it were, and produce mutated sperm, fertilize um, eggs with these mutated sperm, and then go through various generations. You can see that here, schematic. Mutate the male, use a normal female, and mate with this mutated male. This M stands for any odd mutation. Then you generate in the F2 generation, you generate fish that are heterozygous for a particular type of mutation, and then you do random matings. And then you can start imagining, because we have lots of genes in the genome, and not all mutations, of course, are deleterious. So this is a major undertaking here. And it took us about 10 years to generate about 50 complementation groups that have a desired phenotype that is not properly developing T cell and thymus. And interestingly enough, this was organized by my long term colleague uh, Michael Schorp, and he enlisted the help of dozens of medical students who wanted to gain some experience in research. And the primary lesson they were told was it's bloody hard work. Okay, so you think for five seconds and you work for 10 years before you know the answer to your question. So in the F3 generation, when you remember your genetic courses, there is a quarter of these random matings generates homozygous mutants for a particular mutation that you identify and recognize by your phenotype. 
And the phenotype was recognized at the time by RNA in situ hybridization. That is a method of um, detecting the presence of a specific messenger RNA by using a, uh, a complementary um, uh, 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 complementary RNA that is haptenized so that the haptin on this RNA can be recognized by some histochemical stain. And that histochemical stain then results in a particular cell type that you can see here, or a group of cells rather, to turn up in this slide. You can't really see it, but the original color is, is blue. And there is always a control in it. This is actually the, the bilateral thymus. And the probe, <coughs> so the labeled RNA stands for RAG1. And you now remember from yesterday, RAG1 is a gene or a gene product that is involved in assembling these uh, T cell receptor genes. So that indicates developing T cells. And there's a control which you might not be able to see here. This is the hypothesis which we always do to control for failed um, experiments. And then you can see the different phenotypes. So there are happy fish that don't have any developing T cells. This is our prime phenotype. Perfectly healthy fish, but no T cells developing. Or reduction to various degrees compared to the wild type. So just to give you an indication how much work that was, Michael looked at, or his and his helpers, looked at about half a million embryos under the microscope and scored them individually. Didn't give them names though, but they certainly <laughs> scored them. Um, to identify these, eventually, these 50 complementation groups. So that was really a lot of work. But now this proves an incredibly valuable resource, and I will give you two examples why that could be put to very good use to understand the immune system in lower vertebrates. So here is a table that gives you the result of this first round of this screen. This is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. In fact, six, six come out of our uh, screen, six genes identified. Now, how do you identify these genes? I'm not going into the detail, but you probably have heard from your genetics lesson that the procedure one uses for a random mutation to associate with a particular phenotype is called um, genetic mapping, recombination mapping, or positional cloning. So it's essentially using polymorphisms in the genome and the segregation of polymorphic um, a markers in the entire genome and you follow the segregation of these sequence changes as it were with a particular phenotype and if there is congruence you know that this marker must be close to the gene that causes or the mutation in the gene that causes your phenotype and if you do that right eventually you come down to a sing single nucleotide that is changed and has this deleterious effect. It sounds very simple it's relatively difficult when you have to work with a genome that is not well characterized, so you don't quite know where you are. The linkage groups are not well defined, the markers are not well defined, so it's a lot of work. Um, but it's becoming easier and easier the better the resources are developed, and it goes faster and faster. The first time, the first mutation that was isolated from this screen by this procedure took us about four years. Now we can, we are down to maybe three to four months. But what was the outcome of that, um, of that screen? For example, Icarus. Icarus is a transcription factor um, identified originally by, uh, Giorgio, uh, by, by Katya Georgiopoulos. This is why it has this Greek name. And it regulates lymphopoiesis. Um, so an intact gene of Icarus is required to regulate lymphopoiesis. It's a very complex protein, so mutations in different parts of the protein have complex phenotypes, and I'll come to this um, uh, in a little moment. So we can, by way of example here, we can identify now the genes that are responsible for our phenotype that I showed you before. And because we are looking at complementation groups, that for the genetically inclined amongst you is, is then clear this must all be different genes because they're not complementing each other when we are testing them. 
So that means we have about 50 genes in our resource. We are close to 20 now to having isolated them and there are some rather interesting results and I will, as I said, I will give you two. But before we come to this, I would like to illustrate what we can do when we study the immune system. Because as I said, we can make these fish transgenic and the way to do it is to isolate a promoter that directs the expression of a certain gene normally into a specific cell type or at a specific developmental stage or under specific conditions, for example, before or after stimulation of cells. And one important cell type that is, is required in the immune system to actually initiate an immune response are cells that present antigen to lymphocytes. We've been discussing lymphocytes before that have all these fantastic antigen receptor, but if there is no way for them to see the antigen, of course, they will not be stimulated. And the cells that do the job are collectively referred to as antigen-presenting cells, which is, of course, a very generic term, and there are various types of them. The most famous of which are presumably macrophages, and they're famous because macrophages were discovered by a Russian immunologist more than 100 years ago, Mechnikov, where he discovered that these cells that would go around and engulf parasites or certain uh, um, uh, uh, inert substances and basically remove debris. And they're also very important, for example, during development when tissue has to be remodeled. The second famous cell type is dendritic cells, uh, famous because they were discovered 30 years ago maybe, um, and the discoverer of these cells was given the Nobel Prize just a day after this uh, man has sadly died. Um, who knows the name? A chap called Steinman. So he discovered this cell type, and I will give you some graphical illustration of this. And he was really had a lot of opposition to convince his colleagues that these cells were important in taking up antigen, processing it, and showing these antigens to lymphocytes. So both macrophages and dendritic cells help the immune system to engage um, lymphocytes to uh, uh, carry out an immune response. And one can make these cell types fluorescent by using genes that are primarily or even better exclusively expressed in these particular cell types. So this promoter then is put in a joint to your fluorescent protein uh, or the gene encoding it into the fertilized egg as I explained in the very beginning then you make them trans, uh, uh, transgenic and fluorescent in the cell type and you can see that here even at this light it's a, it's a very uh, interesting shape it has these protrusions and these cells are quite mobile and basically patrol the tissue constantly and if it works So you can see the nucleus here, and you see the quite rapidly changing cell surface of this macrophage. This is when it sort of travels through the, this particular uh, experiment through the embryo. And this is the gene that was used to mark these cells with the green fluorescent protein, CXCR3, and you might remember or recognize this um, acronym CXCR3 is one particular type of chemokine receptors that are important for communication, so the cells are being told where they should go. So you can make these cells transgenic and you can observe them under the microscope. Now this is of course a, 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 a time lapse, but when you watch them through the microscope you can really see them how they behave and they're quite fast. They travel quite fast through the tissue and you can uh, even use a fancy variation of the theme by using a fluorescent protein that can be changed in color by adding a light pulse. And I'll come to this a bit later. So if you now are a friend of this particular cell type and want to see where this one goes and distinguish it from all the other green cells that are also wandering about in the embryo, you can shine a light on them 
and change the color from green to red, for example, and then this red color will stay and the cell, you can follow the cell that you marked in one place and see where, how long it takes for it to go to another place. Now you can, of course, then use this to look at the phenotype of these cells. So in this particular experiment in the embryo, about 90% of all cells have a macrophage-like phenotype that is relatively blunt structures, these blebs of the cytoplasm, whereas these spiny-like structures that are characteristic of dendritic cells that have these dendrites that we know from the nervous system, they make up about 10%. So it's, it's very easy to see, you can, it's very easy to score. Now when you can do the morphology, just to give you an indication, and what you can then do is you can look for the specificity of your marker, which is never absolute. But here, for example, we are looking at dendritic cells. This is normal Gimsa stain, dendritic cells, macrophages, neutrophils, monocytes, and eosinophils. The lymphocytes are not marked. And you can see there's a heavy skewing. So this GFP negative cells are the ones that are, um, or this is non-transgenic, you see that most of the cells are neutrophils, monocytes, eosinophils, and the dendritic cells and macrophages are a relatively small part of these myeloid cells. But when you mark them with GFP using that gene, the bulk of them are, that are green are dendritic cells and macrophages. This is how they look under the electron microscope. So you can see that you are biasing your detection using this particular genetic marker towards a certain subset of cells. This is what you want. Of course, it's not perfect. As you can see, it's not all dendritic cells. The macrophage is also labeled and some of the neutrophils and monocytes and so forth, but the majority that is labeled in the adult animal are dendritic cells. Now you can even observe these cells taking up debris or bacteria and in this experiment that I will show you a short video of, this, this red stuff here is bacteria. This is the macrophage. And here the macrophage has ingested a bacterium and of course will then digest the bacterium and eventually the red fluorescence will disappear. So, and you can now see how the macrophage takes this red spot with, with it when it travels. So it's basically a very short frame, seven minutes. But it, it has this extended version and when it moves to here, it, it's, it's completely digested. So you can really see how these macrophages are attracted to sites of infection, for example, go there, eat these bacteria, digest them, and then disappear again. Job done, okay, go and find some other target. Now we can use this to study in great detail various processes and development, developmental pathways that are important for the immune system. And I will focus now on the lymphoid compartment because that is of prime interest for us. So here I show you one of the mutants that turned out to be the one that has a mutation in this Icarus gene which encodes a transcription factor that I mentioned previously. So you can see what we've done here. This is our wild type. So three days after fertilization, amazingly fast, the first T cells arrive in the thymus that is in this red circle here and start expressing the RAG recombinase gene. By day five, the thymus indicated here by this signature of expression is quite big. It goes even faster and grows bigger. And here you always have your control, the hypothesis is the growth hormone that is being made in this particular structure in the brain. And now you see why this is very useful, because when you look at the mutant that we know now know has a mutation in this transcription factor, no RAC signal, no RAC signal, no RAC signal, otherwise the embryo looks perfectly normal. The hypothesis is perfectly normal, but there is no T-cell development. So that says T-cell development is abrogated in this particular mutant. This is exactly what we are interested in, because we want to understand which genes are required for this particular process. And when you look for expression of the Icarus gene, there's a clear prediction you have to make. If Icarus or mutation in Icarus affects T-cell development, T-cells must express Icarus. Otherwise, it would be difficult to explain.
In the wild type, you can see these cells expressing across. It's the same region that where, uh, where, is it? Ah, where RAG1 is expressed. But of course, when there are no T cells, there's also no across expression. So that all made sense. But I'm not showing you this for this reason, because we had another much more interesting phenotype that I uh, refer to in passing without giving you the reason. That is because Icarus is also important for B cell development, not only for T cell. It's a, a pan-lymphocytic marker. Now the, the, um, the um, you don't read this here because it just gives you the mutation. It's converting this, uh, this amino acid into a stop codon, but that doesn't really matter. But what is more important is, this is now another way of looking at the phenotype. And I will show you a video a little later. This is now a stand, uh, a still photo, where we just look at one particular uh, time point, and that is 63 hours after fertilization. We normally start our videos at 54 hours after fertilization, when so shortly into the third day of development, then all of this happens. And what you just about might be able to see is this red shade here. This is the epithelium of the developing thymic rudiment. That is the, where the thymus will eventually develop. When it begins, it's one epithelium, one epithelial cell, and it's marked with a marker I will explain a bit later. And then this epithelium sends out chemotactic factors, and I will demonstrate that to you later, and attracts lymphocyte precursors. The lymphocyte precursors sense, they smell, as it were, that there is something where they should go, because T cells, as we've learned, require the thymus to uh, develop. Here is the wild type, and you can see that this, this reddish signal, and this is this green signal, now the lymphocytes are in green, the thymus is in red, and now the green cells are coming, and they're collecting in the thymus. This is where they should go. Now, I showed you this picture before with the RNA in situ hybridization. That only gives you one gene expression. Now, with these different colors, we can see two different genes. One gene that is characteristic for the thymic epithelium, and another gene that's characteristic for the incoming lymphocytes. And you can see that there is nothing here. This pale cell here is a, um, um, a macrophage that is traversing through the embryo, but this bright green cell is a lymphocyte that is not present here. So we can see this in a different way, and I will show you the live video in a moment. Let's see whether I'm promising too much. No, it will come a bit later. Okay, never mind. So, what was the phenotype? We've seen that the, the Icarus mutation affects T cell development. Very simple to see here, even for the untrained eye. But we observed something more interesting, which is when one looks at the immunoglobulin genes in zebrafish, it was discovered many years ago that, um, let's see, yeah, here it is, the immuno immunoglobulin heavy chain, because as you know, the antibodies are composed of a heavy and a light chain, the heavy chain gene locus in bony fish consists of a cluster of variable elements, diversity elements, joining elements, constant elements. And then what happens is there is a second element in this locus, another set of diversity elements, another set of joining elements, and two further constant regions. The constant region mu and a constant region delta. And that is quite well known to you when you study human or mouse immunology. There is even more in mouse and human that come more constant regions, but we are not discussing this at the moment. But in, in zebrafish it was found that there is another constant region that is called either T, theta, or zeta, depending on which group has discovered this, in which species, that allows the cell to make two different isotypes of antibodies. They can use VDJ to this, or they can use VDJ to this. And this is just a splicing. So they have two versions, the theta or Z, isoform or the mu or delta isoform. 
And you might say, okay, this is just chance. When the recombination goes, it begins at the V and either uses this and goes to here or it uses this and goes to there. And you might say this is just chance. And I probably would have agreed with this until we had studied the phenotype of this, mut this fish mutant that had a mutation in this Icarus transcription factor. Now, all of a sudden, this rearrangement that we just discussed, V mu for the downstream or V zeta for the more upstream one, T or zeta and the mu, has a different net result. We don't see this in the mutant. The zeta is completely absent. This is the schematic here. So the cell can either make a mu positive B cell type or a zeta positive T cell type. And this zeta positive T cell type is completely missing in this Icarus mutant. So by studying this mutation, we had the surprising finding that this, the choice of the constant region is by no means random. It is programmed. It needs a particular regulation of gene expression or assembly of these loci to make these two different isoforms. And you might say, okay, well, who cares? Mu or zeta? You, of course, think if we preserve this, there must be a reason for this. And I will now attach this to some recent finding, not our finding, but that was uh, uh, published uh, just recently, you can read the details, where somebody was looking or a group was looking at where this IgT or IgZ, that's the same, these IgT expressing B cells are located in the fish. And what they found was that the B cells that make this particular isoform of antibody are locating to the mucosa. Remember, I showed you in the lamprey that there was one T cell type that prefer preferentially located to the mucosa. We know that some B cells, particularly those that make the IgA that I alluded to, also home to the mucosa. And now this particular B cell type in the fish also homes to the mucosa. And what did I want? Ah, yeah. So, and when they looked, this is the only interesting part here, when they looked at where this IgT, this antibody that has this T end rather than the mu end, they found that this is in the mucosa but not in the serum, indicating that the mucosa is probably shedding in an IgA type fashion this particular immunoglobulin to the outside world. And what is even more interesting, and, I'm, and then, then I'm uh, reminding you of a theme that I mentioned several times now, and this I'm sure you, impossible for you to see. So you take my word for it. Now bacteria in the intestine of the fish are coated by this IgT immunoglobulin. Very much like bacteria are coated by, VB, by, by VCBP proteins in the amphioxus or by IgA in the mouse intestine or in the human intestine, there is a special type of immunoglobulin that coats enteric bacteria. And I think this now brings us again to this scheme. There must be a reason for this, why these poly structurally polymorphic and secreted immune molecules, be it VCBP or immunoglobulins, or indeed, which I didn't say, but the, the VLRB is also a secreted molecule, although nobody has really looked whether VLRB is also in the intestine of lamprey larvae. But nonetheless, the more diverse your effector molecules are, the more diverse your microbiota is. And it seems that various types of molecules have been used to somehow influence this. I emphasize this does not tell us what is cause and effect. Of course, you can speculate about this and we can discuss it perhaps on Friday. But nonetheless, it's really quite surprising now that more and more evidence goes into the direction that apparently there is some management, let's call it in this loose term, of structurally diverse immune effectors and microbiota. And the skin in fish 
when you think about it in anatomical terms, it's just a single epithelium that separates the fish from the outside world, whereas there is a single layer of epithelium that separates the intestine from the outside world, because the inside of the intestine is basically the outside, just outside in. So a single epithelium needs to defend itself in proper ways, and perhaps this is one way of doing it, defense, but it might also be involved in managing the structure and composition of the microbiota that is at the surface, either on the skin or um, in the intestine. This is the two surfaces, and of course the lung, that is also quite important. So this is a recurrent theme, and I have a clear uh, view on this. I think that um, this allowed us, or the elaboration of these diverse molecules allowed us to manage a more complex uh, microbiota to the beneficial effect of both the bacteria and uh, our multicellular organism. Now, I'm coming back to the thymopoiesis, because this is where we do most of our work in, and I mentioned all of this before, just to remind you. And now I'm giving you a, 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 a schematic that I use now for 15 years or so, and I think it's still quite useful to understand what we really try to um, work on. It is the process of thymopoiesis, and thymopoiesis is nothing but a term that describes how the thymus develops and functions. I showed you in passing this one a still photo of this Icarus mutation where there is this red cell, that is the epithelium, here it's orange, but it was red in the, in, the, in the video or in the picture. So this is the epithelium that attracts these progenitors, and once these progenitors are trapped inside this microenvironment, they will be specified, that is, told you have to become a T cell. And then they go through various selection processes that you read about in the textbooks before they finally are quality controlled and egress to the periphery. So this is the process of thymopoiesis. It encompasses not only T cell development, it also encompasses the development and function of the microenvironment. And ideally, one studies this in conjunction. Of course, sometimes one has to be a reductionist and study one or the other, but it is always better to study this in, not in isolation, but in conjunction. And then you can only do it in vivo, uh, in, in vivo, yes. So not in vitro, which makes life a bit complicated and a bit more long-winded, but nonetheless, I think, much more rewarding. Now, now I'm revealing the secret of why the thymic rudiment is red in the developing zebrafish. You can see that here. This is a zebrafish embryo at 50 hours after fertilization, and you see these two cells that you saw before. The thymic epithelium originates from the pharyngeal endoderm of the third pharyngeal pouch in these lower vertebrates and also in mice and human. So it's a specific location in the pharyngeal endoderm that assumes the role to build the thymic microenvironment. It's epithelial, it's endoderm, and it sends these signals that attracts these lymphocytes. Now here's the still photo um, that we've seen. We've seen this picture, if you remember, and I'll come to this in a moment. So how do we do this? We're using transgenesis. In this case, we are using the facility of homologous recombination in bacteria. We give these bacteria a large junk of zebrafish genomic DNA contained in a bacterial artificial chromosome that is then propagated in bacteria. It's about 200 kilobases long. It contains the gene and we target by homologous recombination an extra piece of sequence and that is this red bit here. It's called mCherry. It's simply an acronym for a gene that encodes a red fluorescent protein. So when this homologous recombination bacteria has occurred, we can take this modified genomic locus, inject it into the fertilized egg, wait, it, wait for it to be in integrated, passed on into the next generations, and then we have a stable transgenic marking of our epithelium. So all the rest is um, 
not colored, but here we see these two cells. And of course they start from one, two, and so forth. One cell, or two rather, so then here is our, what we refer to as the pioneer lymphocyte. Thymopoiesis begins that this small lump of cells attracts the first lymphocyte. Lymphocyte finds its way, and you can see this, it's not a round cell. Lymphocytes, we normally picture lymphocytes as round cells. This cell knows exactly where to go. This is the leading edge, the trailing edge. This cell goes and it will find its place of residence without any hesitation. Once this cell has settled, the friend is already here and many more friends are coming and this is the lecture hall, okay? Grouping of cells. So now I'll show you a video with the fish that is triple, triple transgenic. It has three colors. The, oh, okay. Red for the epithelium, you've seen this. Green, this is meant to be green. I don't know why this is now pink. Well, never mind. Green for the lymphocytes. And blue, this is meant to be blue, for the, for the endothelial cells in the vasculature. Because when the lymphocytes or lymphocyte precursors arrive, they come through the vessels, and then they have to exit from the vessels and, ex and, and, and uh, uh, migrate into the thymic rudiment. So we need these three colors, minimum, to follow the, uh, the migration path of these. Now it's a little better. Now what you see here is now an embryo at 40, uh, 54 hours after fertilization. You will not be easily, uh, will not easily recognize this is the eye, this is the head, this is the yolk. So the, the fish is basically on top of the yolk. All these blue things are the vessels. You see it's a very complicated vasculature but already by that time of development. This is, for those who have seen an embryo, this is the aortic vesicle. This is autofluorescence. Autolytes beginning to form in the aortic vesicle. This is basically the ear of the, of, the, of the fish. And the thymus develops, and this is a good orientation. Ah, this is here, where this finger points to, yeah? And you, you can't recognize anything now because the thymus has not yet formed. But when I run that video, everything okay? Okay, good. So when I run that video, then you will see that first this red patch of thymus begins to form, and then I will point you to the appearance of the first pioneer lymphocyte. So this is Hollywood. These pale cells are macrophages that also are positive for ICROS, but a very low level. So now, oh. so here you now begin to see perhaps the formation of the thymic rudiment, this patch of red cells, but no sign of a lymphocyte yet. Okay, we are converting it to a movie theater now. Yeah, that's perhaps better. So, uh, that, so I use this now. Here's the aortic vesicle. And here's the thymus. And you can see that the thymus is encapsulated by many blood vessels, which sort of makes sense because everything needs to be... Um, uh, or blood vessels seem, need to be everywhere, but this is the site where these cells then exit, either from here, from here, or from down here. And you will see that the pioneer lymphocyte comes from down here. There it was, yeah? All of a sudden it appears out of nowhere. It comes out of the vessel and immediately divides just by chance. Now, let's run the video further. One has disappeared, 
And the one that we see, because sometimes the cells, because we are looking in one plane, otherwise it will not be possible. So then when, of course, the, through the optical plane, when the cell then decides to go away, down or up in the plane, then it's, it's disappearing seemingly, but it might come back so when it come, enters the plane. So this was the one cell, and now look, this cell here divides. Now it's really very interesting because only the cell that is here continues to the thymus. This one is confused, and you will, be you will t certainly know why this cell is confused. See this? This one is on the way, and this one took a turn. So why does it take a turn? Because when cells respond to chemokine signals, their chemokine receptors reorient to the leading edge. And when the cell then divides perpendicular to the migration path, the, the, the second cell doesn't have a concentration of chemokine receptors at the leading edge. So for the moment, the cell is a bit confused. It has to sense the gradient and then reorient. Now follow. So this was our friend here. Still the confused one. Why does it stop now? Ah, oh, blast it. Okay. Now we... Just a second. I won't let go, because that video continues. <sighs> Trying to find a video. God, this is the worst possible moment, but it does happen. Okay, I can't find it now. Ah, I know where it is. Here. There we go. Okay. Now. So we run the movie again. Now you orient yourself. It goes a bit faster now. Famous. Pioneer, division, confusion. So now watch these cells. Of course, it goes a bit faster now. So the net result, you see they are sort of seem a bit chaotic there. But there's another effect that people have described. When the, when the cell with the receptor at the leading edge then finally hits the target, it binds to the chemokine, the chemokine and receptor complex are internalized, and for that moment then the cell is no longer polarized, because it cannot respond. And then it might change direction, because it might respond to another chemokine, for example. And that can actually be shown In this way, I mentioned to you that there are fluorescent proteins that can be made to change their color when one hits them with light. This is such an experiment. This is a fluorescent protein that can be turned from green to orange. Now here's a cell that was turned red. And this cell migrates out of the thymus and comes back again. This is the trajectory. Because these cells are momentarily disoriented when they are finally saturated with chemokine and it's all internalized and then they can go away again. So this migration and homing process is not a directed process that goes straight, cells settle there, finished, but rather it's a statistical process. They, they go there, go out, go in, go out, go in, go out, go in, but the net result is that more and more cells collect in the thymic rudiment. That can be shown directly. You can see this 
This is being observed over, over, over many, many hours. And then you can do what I was referring to, to, gen to gen uh, genetic interference. Now you can say, okay, which chemokine is important for this process, or which chemokines? And one can show that there is a synergistic effect of two chemokines. These two chemokines come from the thymic rudiment, signal, build a gradient, and signal to these incoming lymphocytes, and the lymphocytes sense this, and they respond accordingly. And only if you eliminate both chemokines, that go by the name of either CCL25 or CXCL12, which is the, the, the chemokine that CXCR4 that I mentioned before responds to, and this CCL25, there is a receptor by the name of CCR9 that responds to this chemokine. Only when you eliminate the function of these two molecules together that you see no green cell in the thymic rudiment here. It's a bit higher. Here C cells. Here the cells are sitting just before the rudiment. Here is the wild type. And you can even tell how these chemokines work, long range, short range, by looking at these various combinations of genetic interference. So it's an amazing system because you can watch these cells, track individual cells, and build a complex picture of how cellular behavior occurs in the in vivo real life situation. It's not just guessing and doing in vitro experiments. And were it not so complicated to operate these microscopes, I could even do it. You have to really practice a lot before you can know which buttons to push and which knobs to turn to be able to see this. But this is a quite an amazing result that one can obtain there. I'll defer the uh, the break for another seven minutes, if you allow me. Um, another mutant that proved to be extremely useful and will be even more useful in the future was discovered when we found that the, the failure of T cell development could be traced to the mutation in a transcription factor that has the name MIP, myeloplastosis. Um, uh, virus derived, it was called, and this is the cellular homologue, it was first discovered as an oncogene from a virus, and it has a strong influence on hematopoietic development. Without this MIP function, definitive hematopoiesis, so that hematopoiesis that makes all your cell types in, late, in later life, past the embryonic stage, is dependent on this transcription factor. If this transcription factor is gone, no hematopoiesis. Now imagine what happens if you have a mutation there, you don't survive. If you look at a mouse that has a mutation in, in CMIP, the mice die in mid-gestation because they die of anemia, no red blood cells. They don't care too much about the lack of myeloid cells, perhaps, or lymphocytes, but what they really care about is erythrocytes, because if they're not oxygenized, the tissue cannot survive. However, the surprising finding was, and this is indicated here, which you might not be able to read, although these animals are viable, they make no erythrocytes, and depending on the animal model you are using, they are either useful or not useful. And they are not useful when you study mice. But when you study fish, they are extremely useful. Because the amazing fact is that these fish that don't have erythrocytes still survive. They survive because oxygen can diffuse through their single epithelial layer that makes up the skin. Although they don't grow very much, but they still survive. They survive for a couple of weeks. So that is quite a useful system, as you will see in one moment. So what um, Christian Sosa in, in the lab discovered, that the mutation in this particular uh, a mutant that he found was in the CMIP gene, as I said, and it, and it changed one amino acid in the third uh, helix of the DNA binding domain of this transcription factor where it normally recognizes sequences on the DNA in chromatin and then regulates gene transcription. This is a seemingly innocuous change from isoleucine to asparagine. And he looked at this in the structure and found that the structure was distorted and incapable now of recognizing and binding to DNA. And this is the biochemical evidence for this. This is the DNA recognition sequence that when it is uh, uh, incubated with a wild type protein, 
binds to the DNA and shifts this when one looks at this in a so-called electrophoretic mobility shift assay. It's simply an indication of DNA protein complex formation. And when you look at the, at the mutant, nothing here is completely abolished. So this single amino acid exchange abolishes the function of this transcription factor to regulate its target genes. The protein is made, but it's non-functional. So these fish, they are relatively small, but they look perfectly normal, but you will perhaps recognize, even at that light, the reddish cells that you can see here through the transparent skin are not present here. When you do histological sections, here is the nucleated uh, erythrocytes in the wild type. This is the heart here. There is not a single red blood cell. So you would be very surprised that this fish would survive, but indeed it does. Now it has no definitive hematopoiesis. That is, it has nothing. No erythrocyte, no myelate cell, no lymphocyte. It's basically a fish without a hematopoietic system. The only thing it has is three and a half embryonic macrophages surviving from the very early embryonic period. Nothing else. Now what one can do is one can transplant MHC non-identical hematopoietic tissue into these fish without preconditioning them. Now imagine, you know this is the big problem of organ transplantation or even hematopoietic cell transplantation. When I have leukemia and I need a transplant from one of you, my body has to be conditioned. I have to eradicate my immune system, otherwise I will destroy your incoming transplant that is supposed to rescue my phenotype or cure my disease. And this conditioning regimen is very toxic normally. And not only is it toxic, but for experimental purposes, it distorts the system because it damages the organism. And whatever happens afterwards, we are not quite sure whether this is true through the desired phenotype or through some toxic side effect of the preconditioning. And here this works perfectly without anything. You simply take these fish, use them, and transfuse hematopoietic tissue, or rather cell suspensions, retroorbitally. Isabel Hess in the lab is quite uh, proficient in this. She can do that by free hand. She doesn't even use a micro manipulator. So she has very steady hands. No vodka in the evening, so she has steady hands. And she can do this with a great success rate. And you see that the mutant that doesn't have any red cells here, this is now just looking at the, the, the kidney of the fish, which is full of blood, of course. The mutant is completely empty. Now when she transfers wild-type tissue into this mutant, hemopoiesis is restored. And we can see that here as well. That means not only do we understand now or begin to understand how the system is controlled genetically by doing these genetic screens, we can now make use specifically of the physiology of a certain animal that broadens our possibilities in experimental terms. We would, we would never have been able to do that kind of experiment without complicated genetic manipulations um, were it not for this particular fish model that allowed us to do this hematopoietic cell transplantation without any conditioning. The reason why I brought this up is not so much because it's in the focus of our discussion here. It simply is, uh, the purpose is to tell you it is worth our while to consider alternative models, not to be fixed on humans and mice and maybe lamprey. There is more in the world that could be used to study essential problems. And the key thing, of course, that is of importance for us here that we can now do not only allogeneic transplants but also xenogeneic transplants. So we can now use material from other species and transplant them into this zebrafish mutant and observe what happens to the hematopoietic cells under these conditions.